PlayStation 3 launched in 2006, Sony pushed Full HD 1080p as the next big leap in visual fidelity. But as we know now, the PS3 itself wasn't exactly well suited to such a high resolution. That doesn't mean developers didn't try, and I made it my mission to explore as many of these 1080p games as possible right here on DF Retro. As we continue our exploration of the Full HD library on PS3, we're tackling the years 2008 and 2009. What's in store for the PS Triple this time? Let's find out. As the calendar ticked over to the year 2008, the PS3 was already being sold for $100 less than its original $599 price, and some big titles were on the horizon, such as the much-anticipated Metal Gear Solid 4. This is the year that Rumble was brought back to the PS3 after being absent from early 6-axis controllers. Furthermore, multi-platform development would begin to improve this year, with new games beginning to release with near parity against the 360. Of course, most of the heavy hitters that would arrive in 2008 did not strive for Full HD 1080p visuals and were more focused on pushing new technology. That doesn't mean there aren't some wonderful examples that would arrive, especially later in the year though. I should also stress that while I'm aiming to include as many games as possible in this video, I wasn't able to locate every single 1080p title and not every game can be featured as a result. I had no intention of shelling out for a copy of 2008 World Series of Poker, which is supposedly 1080p. We'll just have to take their word on that one, I think. Furthermore, there are more than 2,500 games for PlayStation 3, and I'm sure there are 1080p titles hiding somewhere in that list that we didn't encounter. But enough of that. Let's just get to the games, baby. Everybody knows PS3 make the best games, right? The first 1080p title for 2008 then is another release from EA Sports, FIFA Street 3. This is a solid game, but unfortunately it's also the final title to be released under the EA Sports BIG label that kicked off with SSX. A sad day indeed. So FIFA Street 3 is very much the football version of NBA Street, I suppose. It delivers a more arcade-like experience rather than attempting to simulate the actual sport which honestly is my preferred way to experience anything FIFA related. This one takes a page from NBA Street, and it might even share the same underlying technology in that it offers two modes, a native 1080p presentation and one at 720p. And just like NBA, the difference comes down to frame rate. In native 1080p mode, the game looks very sharp indeed, but it's limited to just 30 frames per second basically. And this time, I didn't notice any sudden lurches up to 60, so it feels a lot more stable overall. Of course, if you switch the console down to 720p, it does run a lot smoother and feel more responsive, so it's one of those cases where you kind of have to pick and choose what you value more. Stability and frame rate, or clarity? As best as I can tell though, this is pretty much the last EA Sports game to feature a full 1080p native presentation, with the focus shifting more towards 60fps at lower resolutions, though even that wasn't always guaranteed. So how does this fare in terms of the Full HD score then? Well, I'm going with 860p's this time, slightly above NBA Street, simply due to its more consistent frame rate. Of course, we're not done with sports just yet. Our next big release for 2008 is another first party title. It's MLB 08 The Show. This is the second year for MLB The Show on PS3 and it offers a dramatically more complete and polished experience, feeling more like a proper PlayStation 3 game now. Remember, MLB 07 released three months after PS2 and PSP while offering less than stellar visuals versus expectations. MLB 08 though, is a gigantic leap forward in comparison and like NBA 07, it supports Full HD 1080p, but this time there are some caveats to consider, both in terms of visuals and performance. So for starters, if you have all the video options selected at the OS level, the game will default to 720p like this. And the reason is simple. The 720p mode offers enhanced visual effects such as depth of field and it targets a higher frame rate, but surprisingly, it's not a steady 60fps at all. In fact, it's inconsistent, 
hovering primarily around the upper 50s. While this might be the intended way to play the game, I'd argue it's not really good enough and it's definitely a disappointment for a sports game like this. If you want to experience MLB 08 in Full HD 1080p, however, you have an option. Simply uncheck the other options at the system level and the game will boot in a native 1080p mode. The result, a 30 frames per second cap is used instead. And you know what? In this case, I kind of feel like it's a superior option as it results in a far more consistent frame rate. The caveat here is, as mentioned earlier, you lose some of the post-processing effects that were present in the 720p mode, so the game doesn't look quite as nice. So while MLB 08 looks better than NBA 07 overall, the cost of performance is a little too steep for my liking, and thus it falls below NBA's 900 points for 815 instead. Perhaps next year the game will offer an improvement? Guess what though, Santa Monica wasn't done with the NBA just yet. This is NBA 09 The Inside, the final NBA game from the studio, and the last 1080p basketball game on PS3, or is it? So the game starts up proclaiming Full HD support, at least partially, but in reality, it's closer to 720p instead. Yeah, image quality takes a gigantic dip, with a much softer presentation all around. It's simply a case of upscaling from a lower resolution to 1080p than native 1080p rendering, as in the last two titles. Now you can see that the team did upgrade many aspects of the visuals and added a lot more to the overall package, and it does still run at 60 frames per second, but the Full HD nature of the game has been completely eliminated. From the visuals to the interface, this is not a Full HD game any longer. As a result, I can only realistically give this one 250 out of 1080. It's just not a true 1080p experience any longer and is a general step back, but it gets some points just because it actually runs well. Next up, released in April and May respectively, we have two more native 1080p games aiming for a simple, clean visual style. The third Pixel Junk game, Eden, and Echo Chrome. Pixel Junk Eden features an even more minimalistic design language than the prior two Pixel Junk games, almost reminiscent of Loco Roco, but with a deep, chilled vibe instead. What I love about Eden is the liveliness of its world. Everything moves and changes as you navigate each garden, and it all updates at a smooth, perfect 60 frames per second. With its abstract design and smooth performance, Pixel Junk Eden feels as fresh and beautiful today as it did in 2008. It's a, another example of design triumphing above all. Echo Chrome, then, is also interesting and one of the cleanest looking games on this list. It's basically a puzzle game built on the concept of manipulating MC Escher-like artwork to reach your goal. By shifting the perspective, you create new paths for your character to navigate. It's kind of relaxing and a lot of fun in that sense. This one delivers native 1080p with what seems like 4x MSAA. Given that the game is entirely based around thin black lines, it's actually a perfect fit for MSAA and the image is effectively flawless as a result. That said though, the frame rate is limited to just 30 frames per second rather than going for 60, which would have been nice, but honestly, it's not a huge deal in this case, as Echo Chrome is not a fast-paced action game. So, how do these two games rate on the Full HD scale? Well, Pixel Junk Eden scores 1,025 out of 1080, slightly above the prior two Pixel Junk games due to its striking art direction. Echo Chrome, though, scores 990. It is razor sharp, but it's limited to just 30 frames per second. Still, both games are beautiful examples of artists delivering stellar 1920x1080 results on the PS Triple. Then in June, Capcom unleashed an unexpected HD sequel to the classic arcade games Commando and Mercs. It's Wolf of the Battlefield Commando 3, a clever title which combines the original Japanese name Senjo no Okami with the western title Commando. This one was developed by Backbone Entertainment during the time when Capcom was tasking Western studios with revitalizing classic franchises. Some would be hugely successful, I might argue, such as the stunning Bionic Commando rearmed from Grin. But Commando 3 is honestly kind of a disappointment. Now, to be fair, 
It's a competent twin stick shooter at its core, although I would say that with the original games not being twin stick, I'm not sure this was 100% the right move, but I digress. The thing is though, is it does play reasonably well even still, but it has a few issues with its presentation and game design. Specifically, the levels feel overly long and many of the encounters are somewhat dull compared to what they should be. The biggest issue though stems from its visual design. I'm just not a fan of the way this game looks. It has a style that feels very much of that era, if you know what I mean, but it doesn't click for me at all. Compared to the gorgeous pixel art seen in those original games, it really is, again in my opinion, an ugly game. Of course, this was still before the revitalization of pixel art for classic rebirths, so everything had to be 3D, and Commando 3 is of course no exception. It does, however, offer players the option to play the game at native 1080p with 2x MSAA or 720p with 4x. It's very crisp and clean at 1080p especially, though the game is no less ugly even in high res. Unfortunately, playing at this resolution does have a downside and that is performance. So this is another game that runs noticeably worse in its 1080p mode. We're not talking Ultimate Alliance here, but it regularly drops from its 60 FPS target, which combined with the unattractive art design leads to a game that never feels great in practice. If you want smoother performance, that 720p mode offers this as an option. So yeah, Commando 3 is an average revival of a classic series that feels outdated by today's standards, in a way that the original games do not. Thus, I'm giving this one exactly half, or 540 out of 1080, due to the double whammy of unappealing visual design and unstable 1080p performance. It's still a lot better than our previous worst games, but it's not where it should be. Unfortunately, if you're a fan of 1080p on the PS3, our next two games aren't going to do much for you either. The first one is Elefunk. It's a puzzle game that revolves around building bridges capable of supporting, well, elephants. Strange concept to be sure, but honestly it's not a bad idea and it does have some value for sure. And yes, this one is indeed 1080p with 4x MSAA, so it's very, very clean. I'm not a huge fan of its visual design either, mind you, but it's functional and reasonably well suited to this specific type of game. It doesn't push any boundaries in terms of technology, though the physics stuff is kind of cool, but it makes the list either way. I don't have a lot to say about this one if I'm honest though, but I will hand it a nice 700 out of 1080 simply due to its pristine image quality. It loses points due to the somewhat dull visual design combined with the fact that it runs at just 30 frames per second though. The next one, however, is yet another backbone-developed Capcom Rebirth, this time with 1942 Joint Strike. It seems to share the same core technology as Commander 3, though, right down to the water shader used throughout. That said, due to its focus on planes rather than soldiers running around the battlefield, it actually winds up looking less ugly as a result. Now it's not a beautiful game mind you, but it's certainly an improvement in that regard even if it kind of feels like something Phoenix Games might have produced on the PlayStation 2. I also feel this one plays somewhat better, feeling more like a combination of elements from various entries in the 1940X series or whatever. Unfortunately, it does share the same technical issues as Commando 3, namely, it's unstable when played in 1080p. The image quality is solid to be sure, but it just doesn't maintain the target frame rate, which is a big no-no for a vertical shooter. So I'm giving this one 580p's out of 1080. It's slightly better than Commander 3, but ultimately still a letdown. It walks this strange line between pushing some Gen 7 features, but failing to use them in a way that produces attractive results or even good performance. Don't worry though, we're almost to one of the best looking games in PlayStation 3, one that does aim for 1080p, but there's just one more game to talk about before we get to it, and it's rather unique. Presented by Hindustan Electronic Company Limited.
नमस्ते अमी द लास्ट गाय का डायरेक्टर अमन नाम संजय दत्ता This is the last guy, an overhead herding simulator where you run around aerial maps of cities all around the globe, saving people from hordes of zombies. What makes this one unique aside from its bizarre marketing campaign is the fact that it uses real satellite imagery pulled from Google Earth. At least that's what they say, and they use this data to create various cities. Yep, everything you see here is derived from real-world imagery. and it is surprisingly neat and effective i have to admit as a result it's a good match for native 1080p output as you can zoom the camera all the way out while still retaining a suitable amount of clarity this is also one of those cases where the visual design basically demands a high resolution screen the characters are extremely small in this game it would be very difficult to enjoy this at say 480p i'd imagine Unfortunately, the scrolling is updated at just 30 frames per second, so it doesn't feel as fluid as I feel it should. Still, this is one of those games that makes a strong case for 1080p at the time. It is relatively low tech, yes, but it works and it benefits the style of game that they've built. Thus, I give this one 825 out of 1080. Yes, these scores are getting a little bit crazy, aren't they? Thus far then, 2008 has pushed increasingly towards small-scale games and sports of course. The 2D revolution had yet to begin, so 1080p games were increasingly less ambitious in 2008. But our next release is perhaps one of the very best games released on PlayStation 3. This is Wipeout HD, one of the smoothest, most beautiful games yet released for the console. A true showcase that manages to perfectly blend high-resolution rendering and frame rate targets with impressively rich visuals. This is the creation of Studio Liverpool, and it arrived in September 2008 after a long period of waiting. It was worth it. At its core, Wipeout HD offers tracks based on the two PSP games that they created for that system, but remade with much higher quality assets utilizing the full capabilities of the PlayStation 3. Plus, it has a fully redesigned single player mode and loads of things to do within. We're actually looking at the complete version here known as Wipeout HD Fury. This one was even released on a disc in some territories and includes additional tracks and modes. The big question here though is one of balance. Studio Liverpool aimed high with this one, utilizing many techniques that seemed out of reach for 1080p on a PS3. To achieve it, the developers have opted for a variable resolution strategy rather than just targeting straight 1920 by 1080. As a result, the game can vary from a minimum of 1280 by 1080 up to a full native 1080p based on performance targets. This I think is a fair trade-off which perfectly balances fidelity against performance and it's something that would become increasingly common in the future though in 2008 it was still relatively new. The tracks are all richly detailed with a sizable polygon budget, nice texture work and pixel shader work alongside an impressive suite of special effects. Each ship can include as many as 30,000 triangles and the lowest lod for a ship is in the 10,000 polygon range while tracks themselves can have millions of polygons as well. You really can see how much more detail was possible on this generation. What makes this possible though is that their 1080p 60 target was always the goal. The tracks were based on the PSP game true, but new assets were built while keeping this 1080p 60 target in mind throughout development. They could continue to push up the level of detail up until the point that it became clear that the target would be exceeded. It was a nice iterative process. They also built a sophisticated shader system which is put to heavy use especially in zone mode. Of course, the game does not utilize things such as cascaded shadow maps, which would have been far too costly, instead relying on baked shadows and lighting. In fact, I kind of feel like the push towards real-time shadows and lighting this generation is one of the reasons why so many games released struggled to run well. 
and I think Wipeout HD demonstrates beautiful results with its completely offline solution. Furthermore, the game makes heavy use of the SPUs. The developers offloaded things such as physics, particle simulation, data decompression, dynamic lighting, and more. Basically, the CPU is used to keep the heat off the RSX as much as possible. But alas, even with these beautiful visuals, there is still one caveat here. The performance is not 100% locked. The team opted for an adaptive V-Sync solution, which leads to screen tearing when performance dips below the target 60 FPS. In fact, if you look right along the top of the screen, you'll see a whole lot of tearing that was intended to be hidden by overscan. But unfortunately, you're probably going to notice it today. That said, it's not as bothersome as you might expect, but it is one blemish on an otherwise impressive package. It should be mentioned that you can run the game at 720p, and this nets you 2x MSAA as well, not to mention improved performance, at the expense of pixel clarity. Ultimately, all these years after Wipeout HD, I've only come to appreciate more what was achieved at the time. This is an amazing accomplishment of engineering and artwork that stands strong today. While it's true that it has a few minor issues such as screen tearing, I still feel this one deserves the full 1080 out of 1080, just for its sheer ambition. Unfortunately, just a week later, we'd go from one of the best examples of 1080p gaming on the PS3 to one of the worst. This is Sacred 2, an action RPG released in early October on PS3, Xbox 360, and PC, and boy does it have issues. Rich covered this one back in the day, complete with a full tech interview, and the results were rather eye-opening. You see, the game delivers full HD 1080p across both PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, and it even does this when outputting 720p, so it's effectively downsampling all the time. But where it gets weird is if you select 480p output. They determined that it wasn't worth spending all those pixels for 480p, and as a result, this reduces the rendering resolution down to 720p internally, improving performance in the process. Problem is, there's no way to actually utilize 720p rendering unless you're outputting 480p. Crazier still, if you use the 480p 4x3 option, it actually renders at 1280x960 internally. Wild. Some of the decisions made in building this game ultimately means that it runs terribly though. The target frame rate of 30 FPS is rarely reached. Instead, your experience with Sacred 2 will involve a near constant barrage of screen tearing combined with choppy movement. It has this hand cranked feel that we often associate with the worst of this generation of games. So what's going on with this one? Well, it's clear that they're pushing techniques such as shadow maps and using an expensive pixel shader setup and I feel it's this combination of visual features that proves just a little too much for these systems at this target resolution. Given the mostly overhead nature of the game, there's a lot of lateral camera movement too, which makes it all the worse. Basically, this is an example of how not to do it. In some ways, it's worse than Full Auto 2 and Ultimate Alliance even, simply due to the prevalence of screen tearing throughout. Given the poor performance and the 2008 release date then, it should be a shoe in for the lowest score on this list, but at the same time, there is some nice technology in play, so I'll be merciful and award this one 250Ps out of 1080, a notch above Ultimate Alliance, which is arguably the uglier game. The next two things I want to mention are both widely considered 1080p titles, but well, let's just see what's up. So first we have Luminous Supernova a PS3 iteration of Luminous from the PSP. I never quite liked this one as much as the original PSP release, but I can't deny that it's still a phenomenal puzzle game at its core. So Luminous is basically a musical puzzle game. A bar moves across the screen to the beat of each song while clearing any matched squares along the way. The key to success is building combos, but dropping them in time with the beat for maximum clear. The combination of wild visual designs and great music really elevates the experience, but unfortunately, the 1080p support is perhaps less impressive than I might have hoped. If you look closely, you'll see some extra crisp 1080p lines in specific areas of the screen, showcasing that it is indeed truly rendering at 1080p, but most of the actual artwork from which the game is built 
seems to have been designed for a lower resolution and has a softer appearance. It doesn't detract from the experience much, but it doesn't offer the pristine 1080p experience I had hoped for either. As a result, I have to give this one a lower score, coming in at 300 out of 1080, just due to the fact that it doesn't really deliver 1080p in most areas of the game. The score certainly doesn't reflect the quality of the game though. After this then, I also wanted to touch on something called Linger in Shadows. This is a unique release in that it's a demo scene project built by the group Plastic, possibly the first of its kind on a console released in an official capacity. It's a truly bizarre and beautiful experience with some truly stunning visuals. I'd always believed that this one was 1080p as well, and most other people on the internet seem to suggest this too, and it does indeed output 1080p, with certain aspects of the rendering seemingly taking full advantage of this, but there are also major sequences where the pixel resolution is much lower, coming in around 720p, so it does actually seem somewhat variable. Not necessarily a dynamic resolution scaling solution, but it does vary per scene, probably due to performance. But I can't deny that what they're showcasing in this demo is visually interesting and enjoyable to behold. It's certainly cool to see such a product on a console like this, and it even has a number of easter eggs and interactive bits as well. These guys would go on to make something called Datura later in the life of PlayStation 3, but for now, it's a cool little demo that I'll give a cool 650 Ps out of 1080. It may not always deliver on the full HD promise, but it certainly is striking. With this, however, there's just two more things to address for 2008. Firstly, I did not mention it earlier, but I wanted to address this long-standing discussion around Disgaea 3. You know, the first PS3 entry in the popular strategy RPG series. For years, I've seen comments suggesting that this was a 1080p game with low-res pixel art characters. So we investigated and determined that while it does upscale to 1080p, and that's probably where the confusion comes from, the internal rendering resolution is actually just 720p. Too bad. Hopefully though, that clears things up. Our final game for 2008 though is not exactly what I describe as a banger. Or maybe it is, I don't know, you tell me. It's Brain Challenge from Gameloft, which arrived in late November on that PS Triple. This game was clearly inspired by the popularity of Brain Age for the Nintendo DS, which was released back in 2005. I only mention it here though, because it does have this super clean 1080p interface, along with full 3D characters displayed in Full HD. There's really not much more to it, but I was kind of surprised that they would even bother targeting a higher resolution in a game like this, so I wanted to mention it here. So what do we want to give it? I don't know, it's not an amazing looking game by any means, but it does hit 1080p, so how about we split the difference and go with 510. Let's do it. With that, however, we've reached the end of 2008, and aside from Wipeout HD, I'd argue it wasn't a great year for 1080p games on the PlayStation 3. Pixel Junk Eden and Echo Chrome definitely help, but most of this year's heavy hitters were firmly in the 720p category, or less even. As a result, the 2008 Full HD grand total is just 670p's, our worst year yet. We still have a ways to go, however, at least up through 2013 or 2014 in the launch of PS4, but things start to get a little weird from here. 2009 and 10 are both extremely sparse when it comes to 1080p releases before the release schedule picks up again big time in 2011. So what do they have in store for us? Let's find out. Dear PlayStation, just got my PS3. So what you got? What do I got? Two words, montage. Two thousand nine wasn't a great year for 1080p, but it was an important year nonetheless, as this is the year Sony finally started to turn things around with the PS3. They would unleash a redesigned system, the Slim, at a lower price point, while completely changing the branding with a new logo and new packaging for games. It's the year Naughty Dog would unleash the seminal Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, and Guerrilla Games would finally deliver Killzone 2, both of which offered a new level of visual fidelity for the system. This was also the year when Sony rolled out the very first commercial featuring Kevin Butler. Dear PlayStation, 
MLB 09 the show thinks I can't hit the high and inside fastball. You're going to fix that, right? <laughs> well, Dustin, PlayStation gamers demand the most realistic baseball game ever, so we're just going to keep it as is. It's called integrity. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just polishing my MVP trophy. How many MVPs do you know that can't hit that pitch? Apart from you? MLB 09 The Show, the most realistic baseball game ever. Rated E for everyone. Say what you will about Kevin Butler, but this ad campaign was definitely a huge win for Sony. They moved away from the more abstract, which to be fair, I did enjoy, to something that was a lot more immediate and attention grabbing. It worked. Of course, the game featured in this initial Kevin Butler ad is none other than MLB 09, The Show. And I'd argue this is the year when the series finally hit it big. This time, MLB brings a significant step up in visual quality over the last game. Remember, both games default to 720p, but 1080p is available by unchecking the lower resolutions from the system menu. This will probably be the last MLB game we discuss today though, as after this point, the 1080p modes become upscale rather than targeting actual 1080p native. For now though, MLB 09 includes all the post-processing effects from the 720p mode, unlike 08, and it looks pretty darn good while doing so. For this era, MLB 09 was actually one of the best looking sports games on the market, and one of the only ones to retain full HD 1080p support. Beyond this, the frame rate is boosted up to 60 FPS, though it doesn't necessarily retain this at all times, but it is a huge step up from MLB 08. If you want a stable 60 though, you're going to need to use the 720p mode. Still, San Diego Studio continues to impress with this release, making them one of the developers that focus the most on hitting 1080p on the PS3, and thus I give this one the same 900ps as NBA 07 for bringing the quality back up. Visual quality is superior, even if performance is slightly below expectations. It's a very nice looking game in the end, so I think it deserves this score. But let me rewind for a moment, actually. MLB 09 was the big spring game for PS3, but the actual first 1080p game we should talk about came out a little bit earlier, and that's the second game from that game company, and it's known as Flower. This is an interesting one then. It's far more visually ambitious, with large open fields filled with flowing blades of grass that react to the wind as you move through the world. It's deeply relaxing, but also rather melancholic, I would argue. A real treat to play. That said, it's clear that sacrifice was required to pull this off and the resolution is walked back significantly from their prior game flow. Essentially, it renders at 1440 by 810 which is still above 720p, mind you, but not reaching the heights of Full HD 1080p. Furthermore, it's limited to just 30 frames per second this time, though at least it's quite stable. So this is an interesting middle ground then, but the end result is generally pretty good. The game looks reasonably clean in motion, and the design is attractive even today. Thus, I give Flower 790ps out of 1080. In April then, another small scale game arrived known as Comet Crash. This one is a tower defense game, much like Pixel Junk Monsters, but I found it less enjoyable overall. The aesthetic is also somewhat clinical, I might say. But from a pure technical point of view, the developers have done a good job here, as the game does render at a native 1920x1080 with 4X MSAA. It's about as clean of an image as you could ever expect from the PlayStation 3, and for that reason alone, it actually looks pretty good in action. Ultimately, this one is very, very clean, but boring, at least from a visual perspective. But the sharpness of it and the quality of its MSAA at least earns it a solid 815 out of 1080. So, not bad. After this, Namco returns with a brand new Katamari game for the PlayStation 3. This is Katamari Forever, a remixed semi-sequel which brings a range of stages from prior Katamari games with a few entirely new stages. The idea is that the king of all cosmos has lost his memory. To restore it, you play through black and white versions of classic stages while bringing color to the world. The other stages then feature the Robo King, a robotic version of the King of All Cosmos. 
It's a beautiful game with a new art style designed to give everything this pencil sketch look. And yes, it does run at full HD 1080p, making it the sharpest Katamari game yet, at least at the time of release. There's no anti-aliasing here, of course, which perfectly matches the game's visual style, given that the textures are also unfiltered, just like those original games. What I love about this one, though, is the combination of fresh new visuals and a fantastic remixed soundtrack, including some of my old favorites, including a remix of Pulse Phase from Ridge Racers on PSP. The only real caveat with this one is the frame rate. It's just 30 frames per second, like most of the other games in the series, but it can drop from time to time in the 1080p mode, so it's not perfect. By and large though, it works well enough. While Katamari Forever doesn't break any new ground, I do prefer the look and feel of this game to beautiful Katamari on Xbox 360, which runs at an unstable unlocked frame rate on original hardware. It should be noted that beautiful Katamari runs on Vicarious Vision's Alchemy engine. Yep, the same engine which powered Marvel Ultimate Alliance and was initially planned for the PS3 before being cancelled. Given the performance on that game, it's probably a good idea. Instead, we got Katamari Forever. So given the quality of its presentation, I give this one a solid 1000 out of 1080. If the frame rate were stabilized, it could go a little higher, but still, Namco did a great job with this release. Next up though, is another unusual project. Our first Unreal Engine game for the PS3 on this list. This is Fat Princess, a native 1080p Unreal Engine 3 game. Yep, I didn't think such a game even existed on the system, but the development team actually managed to deliver. So Fat Princess is mostly played from a tilted overhead perspective, and the art design leans heavily on cell shading, to great effect I might add. The game does feature impressively implemented shadows as well, which are cast on moving objects, and sometimes even utilizes things such as Unreal's depth of field. So while it's definitely constrained in terms of overall complexity, there is more going on with this game than I actually expected. Beyond that, the quality of the texture work and the simple yet clean model design delivers strong results. Surprisingly, it also runs at a fairly consistent 30 frames per second, and it's this combination of a stable frame rate and the clean rendering that really surprised me here, as the PlayStation 3 traditionally has a somewhat poor relationship with Unreal Engine 3, though by 2009 at least things were starting to improve. As a result of its strong art design and super crisp image quality, in addition to the impressive work in delivering Full HD graphics with UE3, I have to give Fat Princess a full 960 out of 1080. Remember Military Madness on TurboGrafx-16? No? Well, in 2009, it received a new iteration, known as Military Madness Nictaris. A clever name again, which combines the US and Japanese titles. Hey, haven't we seen this before? Well, that's for good reason. Backbone worked on this project as well, and you know what? I like it a whole lot more. So this one is basically a hex-based strategy game, like the original on PC Engine, presented from an overhead perspective with battles featuring more dynamic animated sequences. The game targets native 1080p output once again, just like the prior two Backbone games we discussed earlier, and it seems to utilize 2x MSAA, resulting in remarkably crisp, clean lines throughout. This also applies to the user interface, which is very beautifully and sharply rendered. I think they've done a good job capturing the look and feel of the original game, but using 3D polygons instead, it works. That said, of course, the game is limited in scope as a result of its subject matter, but I think it works and runs surprisingly well. It's a strong example of where 1080p can be strategically deployed with strong results. Backbone did a really nice job with this one. As a result of its crisp 1080p image, with edge treatment no less, and its relatively stable frame rate, this return of Nictaris deserves at least 700 out of 1080, I think.
Next on our list is Critter Crunch, a puzzle game from Capybara Games and an important title for the future of the company. You see, Capy was primarily known for its work in the mobile space by this point, and indeed Critter Crunch started there as well, but around this period they were beginning to explore the console space, and I think this serves as a great example of what they could bring to the table. Basically, it's a simple puzzle game involving these critters. Certain combinations cause explosions which deliver points. It's a fun little puzzler for sure, but what really sets it apart are the beautiful hand-drawn visuals. The characters are bold, stylized, and beautifully illustrated. The animation quality is superb, and the whole thing runs at Full HD 1080p, which serves as a perfect canvas for visuals of this style. Remember, most of their games up to this point were targeting Java phones with super low-res screens, so this full 1080p canvas makes a gigantic difference and really allows them to shine. It runs well, it looks great, and it plays nicely. Basically, a well-implemented and beautiful puzzle game for the triple. Thus, I give this one a solid 1,000 out of 1,080. Next up, we already looked at Comet Crash, but what about another type of crash? A Gravity Crash, if you will. Well, you're in luck, because Gravity Crash is the first original game created by Just Add Water, and it's pretty darn good. It's essentially a modern homage to the BBC micro game Thrust, but with beautiful vector graphics aesthetic and smooth performance. It offers two different control schemes, including a modern dual stick option, and features a soundtrack created by none other than Tim Wright, also known as Cold Storage, the man behind many of the great tracks featured in classic Wipeout games. With its simple, clean design, it's unsurprising that Just Add Water opted for 1080p output targeting 60 frames per second. The extra resolution really helps sell that vector line art design of the visuals, and everything plays perfectly smoothly as a result. It's another example of a super polished classic arcade style experience that benefits from high resolution and high frame rate. As a result, this one deserves 1020 out of 1080. While we're talking 2D games, there's also Digger HD, a remake of an old PC game based on the Mr. Do concept. And it's as simple as it gets visually, but honestly it works pretty well. It all runs at a smooth 60 frames per second as you'd expect, and the transitions between stages are super smooth. It's definitely not pushing any kind of technical boundaries of course, but I still thought it was worth mentioning as it highlights the kind of small scale game one could make while taking advantage of 1080p. It's also kind of an example of the sort of minefield I'm dealing with here when it comes to 1080p support. There's no real indication that it's a 1080p game, and there's probably other games like this out there on PSN or even on disc. For this reason, it's very difficult to determine just how many actual 1080p titles are on the PS3. As for this one, however, I'll hand it a nice 690 out of 1080 then. Just a notch below Nectaris, but not too bad. 2009's last major 1080p title, however, is yet another installment in the Pixel Junk series, and this one is my favorite yet. It's Pixel Junk Shooter. So Shooter involves piloting a craft through a wide range of subterranean stages while rescuing trapped scientists within. The hook for this game involves fluid manipulation, where each section of a stage essentially becomes a puzzle. How do you get through without dying or losing scientists to flowing water, bubbling lava, or the bizarre pharaoh fluids? Routing these liquids is key, and this is the game's defining feature, the robust fluid simulation. Destroy a rocky barrier, for instance, and water realistically pours out into the caverns below. It's incredible looking. The developers basically built a 2D particle flow simulation that can run up to 32,768 particles at 60 frames per second spread across 5 SPUs. There's a lot to it though, beyond the scope of this video anyways, but the result is pools of fluid that can flow, collide, and interact with the world in a remarkably realistic fashion. With its simple, clean art direction, they were able to achieve all of this at the aforementioned 60 FPS while also targeting native 1080p. It's one of the smoothest and cleanest looking games we've examined today as a result. Everything here is just perfect. When you couple this with a rich, memorable soundtrack, you have an exceptionally well-made title here that holds up brilliantly even now. This is Q Games at its best. 
Due to its crisp 1080p presentation, smooth 60 frames per second update, and amazing fluid simulation, I'm awarding Shooter 1075 out of 1080. Good job, Q Games. With that, however, we've reached the end of 2009. A banner year for PlayStation 3 to be sure, but not a great one for 1080p games. There were a few others that I could have included though, such as LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga, but that one's technically only 960 by 1080 which is just a few more pixels than 720p. If we included every game like this, the list would be significantly longer. But despite a relatively meager list compared to the prior years, 2009 still comes in with our second highest score yet at 895. With the arrival of 2010, however, Sony has a lot more in store for PS3 fans, including the first next generation sequel to God of War and the release of its Wii competitor, the PlayStation Move controllers, which would go on to become central to their VR solution many years later on PS4. But with that, we've reached the end of part two. Our exploration of PS3's Full HD library is far from over, however, and next time we'll witness the beginning of a shift in the PS3 with the rise of indie games, newfound success, new controllers, HD remasters galore, and the long-awaited arrival of the next Gran Turismo. So, don't miss it.